to come. And uh, Frank will introduce you in the morning service. So we'll keep it a mystery who you are uh, the, for the Sunday school hour. And then we'll give a good introduction in the morning service so that you have full time. We'll go until a quarter till. Okay. And so you should have 42 minutes. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you all. And. You're right, we'll introduce everybody later, but uh, we are from Tennessee, and thankful to be with you this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and you all have been looking at faithfulness over the last weeks in Sunday school, correct? Yes. yes. And uh, to this, this morning, I'd like us to look at some practical areas where faithfulness ought to be implemented in our lives as Christians. So the title, if you're taking notes this morning, would be Practical Faithfulness. In the life of a believer, practical faithfulness in the life of a believer. And I would like to, to consider this morning, there are two directions that you need to consider being faithful as a believer. One is to your master, specifically to know that you're to be faithful to a new master. And you would know well that you are not a servant to an old master, your sin, any longer. Romans chapter 6 makes that very clear. In Romans chapter 12, Paul begins by very quickly talking about what it is that your life is to be dedicated to, directed towards. And look with me at Romans 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto who? God. So you're to be yielding, submitting, sacrificing giving over the rights to your life to who? God. To God. And it says, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of who? God. Okay, so first of all, you're to be faithful to a new master. And it's reasonable for you to be submitted to and serving and faithful to a master. You know, faithfulness is not um, a theme that our culture really embraces. And, and I'm sure that this has come up probably in your Sunday schools, but infidelity of not being faithful is not just in the area of marriage or relationships. It's oftentimes in areas of employment. Is there a lack of faithfulness by employees to be on the job on time? Yeah. Sure, it's a problem. Is there a problem with faithfulness to, as a parent, do what I ought to do and taking care of things I see that need help in my home? Sure, that could be a problem. But in the era of a Christian recognizing that they're to be faithful to their master, to the God who gave his son for them, that's often, I think, a struggle. Which is why Paul reminds the, the folks in Rome, uh, this is something that you and I need to consider. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, turn back to Romans 6 real quick. And let's just remind ourselves who our new master is. Romans 6 and verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that's Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, let's read the end of verse 6, we should what? Not serve sin. So, you were, in your old nature, a servant to who? To what? To sin. That's what you would serve. The Bible says in verse 11, Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So your old master, you're to reckon, to think, as though you're what? You're dead to that, and, or but, alive unto who? God. Unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're being able... To serve God and to be faithful to Him is not enabled by your ability. It's only made possible because of Jesus Christ in you. You cannot be good on your own. In fact, to attempt to do so is, is really difficult, it's discouraging, and it doesn't work. If you're going to be faithful in both uh, to the new master, you're going to do it because you have Jesus Christ, which necessitates me telling you this, if you don't have Christ, you don't have new life. Makes sense? If you don't have new life, you need new life. You don't have the new master, and you can't serve him until you have Christ in you, enabling you. And so that's an important recognition in verse number 11. 
is that once you have Christ, you need to reckon or continue to think about the fact that you are dead to sin, but alive to God. Look at verse number 17 in Romans chapter 6. Verse 17 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Okay, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of Okay, so you notice that you have a new master, and it's no longer sin. So let me ask you this morning, number one, are you faithful to your new master? You know, that's a real big question in this matter of faithfulness, practically speaking. Because on a daily basis, you're making decisions that are either serving your old master, sin, or your new master, the God who gave his son for you. In Romans 12, go back to Romans 12, and let's go back there and consider this about being faithful to your new master. It's reasonable. Being faithful to your new master as a living sacrifice means living out Romans 6.11, reckoning in your mind who you belong to, who saved you. It's your reasonable service. In 1 Corinthians 6, you don't need to turn there. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, because you don't belong to yourself anymore, you ought to do something. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are... Okay, Paul over and again talks about the fact that he's a steward. Your being faithful to your new master is a recognition every day that your body, your spirit, belong to God. They aren't yours. And yielding yourself to your new master just makes sense. But how many times during the day do we make decisions that don't reflect what our new master would want and being faithful to him but uh, I'm going to go over here and do what I want to do again. You know, that's the battle that a Christian faces. You can live to your flesh, to your old nature, but the Bible tells us that that's not what we're to think like. We're to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So, are you being faithful? It's reasonable. Now, what would be the opposite of reasonable? Unreasonable. Unreasonable. So when the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, your new master, which is your reasonable service, what's the opposite? Well, it to be unreasonable. You ever known unreasonable people? You know what that is? They're not thinking. And I think that's a common problem we all face. Now, have you ever caught yourself being unfaithful to God and said, why am I doing that? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to be unfaithful to your new master. So unreasonable, being unfaithful to your master takes place when you're conformed to the world. Look at verse 2 of Romans chapter 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. Now, where does it take place? Where does it take place that I act reasonably? It takes place in my mind. Be not conformed to this world. That's going to be in the day-to-day -day decisions that you make. You're either faithful to the one who saved you and gave, or the one who gave his son for you, God, who loved you, gave his son for you, or... You're not being faithful in your thinking. It doesn't make sense to be a unsubmitted or unobedient child. First um, Peter chapter one verse thirteen says, "Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance." But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be holy. Why? That makes sense. If I'm in, in Christ and my new master wants me to be holy, then what do I ought to be doing? I ought to be pursuing holiness. You know, it says as obedient children. Nothing is more frustrating than disobedient children. <laughs> 
Have you ever seen the, the frustrated parent at Walmart? Come on, kids, get over here and do what I'm telling you to do. Stop. No, mommy, I want what I want. Isn't that just... Ah! Now, do you think most parents want that to change? Yeah, they do, but do they know how to make it change? No. 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 You know, their children's unreasonableness is, in a lot of cases, the result of parents who are unreasonable or inconsistent, right? But God isn't like parents on this earth. God is terribly and utterly consistent with what he thinks. And God is consistent with what he wants and what he tells us he wants. And he consistently tells us he will reward what he wants out of us. So the unreasonableness is not that you can't be holy or you can't do right or you can't be faithful to your master. The unreasonableness comes on our part when we're just saying, I don't want to. And I'm not going to. And I'm going to do what I want to do. So verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now there's a purpose for this faithfulness. And I, I want to connect chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 to the rest of chapter 12. Because the two go together. Faithfulness to your new master is directly connected to your faithfulness to the next thing we're going to look at. There's a purpose behind your faithfulness. This is uh, kind of a third point under your new master. So it's reasonable service, what there is an unreasonable service. And then number three is the purpose for the faithfulness to the right master. It says that ye may prove what? What is that? Okay, verse 2 of chapter 12 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove it to who? You know, whenever there's an action to take place in Scripture, it's good to ask yourself, what's the purpose? Prove it to what? To myself? I would think that's true. But the following verses are going to point out that there's interaction that takes place with believers. And can I tell you this? Your faithfulness to your new master makes his will clear to others. Can I say that again? Your faithfulness to your new master makes his will clear to other people. Look, if you would, at what the verse says, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is God's will? What is God's desire? Well, it's that you be conformed not to the world, but that you be... Yielding yourself to Him. But who needs to see that? Does God need that? Does God need to be proved by you that you're really a Christian because you don't conform yourself to the world? No! God knows whether you're His child or not. Did you know that? God isn't looking down from heaven and saying, Ah, I wonder if He's really doing good at being a Christian this week, and if, I, if He died this week, if I let Him into heaven. That is not what God does. God does not look at your actions on a day-by-day -day or week-by-week -week basis and say, well, I'll let him into heaven, or I won't let him into heaven. Heaven is determined, and a relationship with God is determined by what you've done with Jesus Christ, God's Son. It isn't, it isn't based on how your performance is going, but does your performance, your actions during the week, do they impact other people? Yeah, they do. In fact, Ephesians 5, verse 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. Verse 10 of Ephesians 5 says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You and I are constantly called to not live in darkness or in sin, but to live by His Spirit's power to right. Proving what is acceptable to, to God. Now, why all this proving? Proving it to who? Well, again, the statement, your faithfulness to Him makes His will to others clear. In your family, in your home, in your church. And you all have been looking at faithfulness in the church, so this is point number two. Number one, you need to be faithful to your new master. Number two, you need to be faithful to your new family. You need to be faithful to your new family. 
Did you know that when you trusted Christ for salvation, you received a family? Amen. That was kind of weak. <laughs> Look around this room. Just take a moment. Look around. See these people? If you've trusted Christ, they're your family. Amen. That's a big deal. Amen. You know, I often, I often think that we, we talk about church in a very abstract way. If I said to you, be faithful to church, you know what you'll think? Be faithful to coming to the doors of this building. Which is true, but for what purpose do you come through the doors of this building? To be with your brothers. To be with brothers. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. What? So much the more as you see the day approaching. Why, why am I to not forsake the assembling? Well, it's the assembling of yourselves. If a family doesn't spend much time together, does that make it hard for the family to get along and to encourage and to help one another? Well, yes. of course it does. Now, here's the thing. Recognize early that faithfulness to church is faithfulness to people. Faithfulness to church is faithfulness to people, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And in verse number 3, Paul is not starting a new thought. He says at the end of verse 2, what is the acceptable and perfect will of God? For I say, through the grace given unto me, verse 3 of chapter 12, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, again, this matter of thinking, right? According to, or according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. And then he talks about gifts that were given to the the church, the body. Now we're going to skip over, not skip over, we're not going to take a time to delve into these gifts today, verses 3 through 8, but here's what I want you to notice. Number two of being faithful to your church, to your family, your new family, it's being faithful to your family by, number one, using the gifts that are in verses 3 through 8 with humility. Now we could take time to talk about these gifts, but notice what the ultimate theme that he says in verse 3 about these gifts. But to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, in the body and in the family, isn't it easy to get proud? Do brothers and sisters ever get proud? <laughs> yes! Ask me about the car trip yesterday and the things I had to deal with with children that are, that are wonderful kids. I love my kids. But do you know what they have in them? A desire to put themselves over somebody else. To think like they're better than, or to, to one-up. You know what one-upping is, right? Well, I saw five alligators. We went across 41 yesterday in the Everglades coming from Fort Myers. And we saw lots of gators and birds and all kinds of things, and the kids loved it. But do you know what's in their nature? It's to one-up. Didn't the disciples have that problem? You know, who's going to be the greatest? Well, I'm going to be better than. You know, all of us have in our flesh, in our old nature, we can serve pride. But can I tell you, if you're going to be faithful to your new master, and you're going to be faithful to your new family, you got to kill pride. you got to put it away. You can't have this attitude of always, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little better than you. Well, I know a little bit more than you know. Well, I know what you don't know, and I'm going to teach you. You know what? All the gifts in verses 3 through 8 are important, and they fit together, and they're necessary. But they're of no use if one puts themselves over the other and thinks, well, I'm better than because I've got something you don't have. No, no, no. That's not good for a family, and it's not good for the family, the church. So being faithful to your new family means, number one, using gifts with humility. Number two, it means doing right by those in the family. And verses 9 through 16 really do go over a number of areas where you need to practically do right by one another in the church. You need to be faithful to your new family by doing right. Now, you can write some of these down because there's a number of them we're going to practically just outline here for us. Practical areas of doing right by others. And I define doing right as love, because that's what Romans 13 defines love as in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Love is doing right by other people. And in verse number 9, 
The Bible tells us in chapter 12, Romans 12, verse 9, a number of practical areas beginning there. So the first one is this. Let love be without dissimulation. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, tells us that we're to be faithful to our new family by, number one, being real. You know what dissimulation is? It's being fake, hypocritical, not, not real. Let love be real. Doing right in a real way. Have you ever known people in the family who do right when it just benefits them? We're talking about the family of God. Those that are children of God, those that are saved. Being faithful means that I do right by people in a real way. Not in a way that just benefits me. Not in a way that's fake or just a facade or, hey, it's just on Sunday morning, I shake your hand. But all week long, I don't even think about you. You know, if you're going to be faithful to your new family, you ought to think about them throughout the week. Yes. It's not very real for me to say hi to my wife twice on one day of the week. <laughs> that would not be very good. And if that's your home, it could change. So can your relationship with those in the body of Christ. You know, we have a lot of technology at our disposal to be real with one another. How hard is it to send a text to a brother or sister in this church? How many of you have a phone that can text? A lot of you do, right? Okay. If you don't, how many of you have carrier pigeons? Okay. <laughs> Good, you're awake. You know where some are. Hey, communicate. Be real. Be real. You know, fake is very easy to have. Our, our culture is full of fake. Facebook is full of fake. I, I really get tired of looking at people's profile pictures and thinking, I have never seen you look that good before. <laughs> what did, I want to get that app on my phone that makes me look better. <laughs> wow! That's not real. You know, uh, you to be faithful with those around you in the body of Christ, it demands that you be real. And, and people appreciate it when you're real, don't they? Mm -hmm. When you really care about people, people, people appreciate that. You appreciate it when someone's real with you, not fake. Number two, be honest about sin. The end of verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9, Romans says, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That sounds so simple, but can I tell you, for you to be faithful to your new master and faithful to your new family, it demands that you be honest about sin. Now, that doesn't mean you go around looking at everybody else's sin and saying, I can't believe you're doing that. That's not the honesty I'm talking about. I'm talking about with yourself. Are you honest about sin? Hate evil and be drawn or attracted to that which is right. You know, have you ever caught yourself being drawn to something that wasn't right? You know, look at me with stoic eyes this morning as though, Frank, I can't You're believe this. Here. What's that? <laughs> the I'm the only sinner in here. <laughs> wow. Hey, if you're catching or noticing yourself being drawn to something that isn't right, that is sinful, that is not right, wake up. Notice it. Be, be aware of that. Be honest about it. You know, it's a good thing for you to recognize that you're trending in a direction. It's a real dangerous thing to ignore that. It's a very dangerous thing to ignore it. Abhor that which... Is that a pretty strong word? Abhor? It's not like, oh, yeah, I don't really like the taste of that. No, it's, oh, that's awful! I can't stand that taste! Does that how you look at evil? Or do you kind of, well, everybody's doing it. It's just what everyone's doing in our culture. And it's just, you know... It's not that big a deal. But if God calls it sin, does God tell us in his word what his opinion about sin is? Isn't it pretty clear? I'm to have the same attitude that my master does. And if I'll be faithful to my master, guess what I'll be a help to? I'll be faithful to my family. The body of Christ family. My family as well, but the family that I'm in now, my new family, will be helped when I hate evil. 
not, not hate people who are evil. Get the clear picture of this. Hating evil does not mean I hate people. Do you hate evil that you're prone to wander to? You ought to. You ought to. You ought to. And you ought to tell, you ought to tell one another, you know, I'm battling with something right now that I really hate. Don't be specific, but just let a brother know sometimes that you're honest about it. I hate my sin, and I hate when I'm getting pulled towards it. Be honest about sin. Number three, practical area of doing right by others. I know this is like the worst outline in the world if you're taking notes to figure out where I'm at with it, but these are just a bunch of lists, okay? Be like family. Number one, be real, be honest. Number two, be, number three, be like family. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with what kind of love? Brotherly love. I love this. Okay, if I'm going to be faithful to my family, I ought to treat them like family. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? This this word here, and I'm no Greek scholar, but it's the word philostagor. Uh, I'm saying it wrong, but you can help me later. Philostor, philostorgos. Something like that. It means fond of natural relatives. Cherishing, Okay. Now, in our culture, there has been a great demise or diminishing of being fond of natural relatives. But even in, in families where there's a lot of problems with family members, there's still a fondness that says, they're my family. Even though there's problems, I love them, I care for them, I have a natural affection for them. Now, can I tell you something? That's the kind of attitude that God's Word is saying we're to have with the family. That's our new family, the body of Christ. I'm to, I'm to care about them like I would for my own son, or for my own daughter, or for my wife, or for my friend. I'm to have a care for them that is, that is like family, that is deeper than just, hey, good to see you this week, see you next week. If your relationships inside the body of Christ, inside the walls of this building, or only, hey, hey, you know, fist bump, elbow bump, whatever, handshake, whatever you do. Is that, is that, is that good? No, it's not healthy. It's not healthy. Now, you're not being faithful to your new family <clears throat> if you don't demonstrate family-like attitudes towards one another. Number four, be selfless. Be selfless. Practical area of doing right by your new family is verse 10. It says to be selfless. It says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Now that's a loaded one. In honor preferring one another. Do you know what it means to defer to someone else's wishes? Okay. I like parties. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> I know. But there is one member of our family who does not like parties. The most important member of our family, and, and probably in the last nine years, has been the reason that I've only eaten at Hardee's once or twice, and that was when they weren't with me. You'll be all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> I'm sure I have been. Now, my wife doesn't like Hardee's, and you'd say, she's a really smart person. <laughs> but do you know why I don't eat at Hardee's? <laughs> That's actually not the reason. <laughs> Some people like terrible food, like White Castle, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Why do people eat there? Okay, <laughs> my point's taken. All right, so why don't I go to Hardee's? Because I prefer and honor her over my... You know, we really struggle with this in the body. To be faithful to our family means to put someone else's desires ahead of ours. It doesn't mean compromise, okay? I'm not compromising truth or right by eating at Hardee's or not eating at Hardee's. Well, some people wind up. <laughs> no, I'm not. It's nothing that's a crucial truth of Scripture that I'm violating by doing so. But I'm violating her in a very practical way that I can show love to her, that I can do right by her. Does this make sense? Now, in your home, how many times during a day do you intentionally make decisions that prefer someone else instead of yourself. Does that make sense? How many times in the body of Christ do you recognize the need 
or desire of someone else and do right by them by deferring to them instead of doing what you want. You know what? If the body of Christ is represented by a bunch of selfish people, very little gets done. That's right. If your home is represented by a bunch of selfish people, very little gets done. That, that makes a difference. A bunch of people are more selfish and they produce children who are selfish. selfish. But if a parent defers to another parent, guess what their kids see? Well, I can defer to my parents because they're deferring to one another. And that's what I want to teach my kids. You know, the body of Christ needs to see Christians who prefer others above themselves. In honor preferring. That word honor is a big deal. It's showing respect to a person. It has to cost you, though, to show respect to somebody. If I hold the door for somebody and let them go first, am I showing respect? But it costs me being ahead in line, right? Now, that, that seems like that's such an easy thing. But don't you notice people that hate letting someone else get in front of them? Like when you drive, for example, in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> it's crazy around here. <laughs> now, let me ask you something. How do you feel when someone cuts in front of you in Fort Lauderdale? It's an opportunity to do it back. Exactly. <laughs> we have much work to do here. <laughs> hey. Do you know that when you're with the body of Christ in that car and you demonstrate an attitude that doesn't prefer the lost person or a person who does you wrong ahead of yourself, you're saying something to the body of Christ? You know, I say it to my kids every time I get loud in the car about my feelings about somebody and I, I vocalize my disapproval. You know what I'm saying? Hey kids, do as I say, not as I do. And I've apologized more than once in our car for having voiced my negative opinion of the actions of others in a way that cannot help that person one iota. Sure. No, it's not helping them for me to yell at them and scream at them. Now, my horn may help them know that I was there, but that's only just so that they don't, you know, have an accident. But my attitude can be really different when I blare that horn, can it? Or, I'm not going to say what I want to say right now because in saying it, I'm not preferring others. I'm not doing right by them. Does this make sense? You may disagree with me, but let me tell you something. In all of our lives, we are selfish. In our own nature, in our old... You know who you're serving, by the way, when you're selfish? Are you serving your new master? No. Are you serving the body of Christ? Your new family? No. Nope. You're serving sin. That's it. It does nobody any good. None. So, be real, be honest, be like family, be selfless. Number five, be diligent. Number uh, Verse 11 says, Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Who's your new master? The Lord. The Lord, okay. Do you know that you're still faithful and you're showing and demonstrating faithfulness to your family, your new family, the body of Christ, when you serve the Lord with diligence. Why? Because you're proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know that the body of Christ is watching you to determine how they ought to do what God's will is. I think that that's often lost on us. That I am a representation to everyone else in the body of Christ of what God wants. And if I'm obedient, it helps you come along. Follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah. So if I'm following, it helps you all follow. If I'm not following, I'm going to wear out your camera going back and forth, aren't I? If I'm not following, guess what? I'm not helping other people follow the Master. Who am I helping them follow? A sinner not living like what he is. He's a new creature in Christ, but he's living like this. And guess what? There's a lot of times families and Christians and bodies of believers who are serving sin. In fact, the Corinthian church struggled with that too. 
Every church struggles with that. Did you know that? Every church struggles with serving the right master. Every church struggles with faithfulness. So, not slothful in business. Not slothful means slow, idle, lacking promptness or readiness of mind or action. Slothful. Some of you, you ever feel slothful on Monday morning? Or every morning? Is that the way that you're to think and act? You know, it's both. It's not just your actions being slothful. It's your thinking being slothful. You may be quick to work. You may have diligence in your actions and in your... I get things done, but in your mind you're really slow at thinking things through. I've been there. Ask my friends. Ask my wife. Diligent. Not lacking promptness. Having a readiness of mind or action. What is your task in the body of Christ and how are you currently fulfilling it? Are you fulfilling it with a fervency? The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, or not fake love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You're to be fervent in your doing what's right by other people. It ought to be, wow, that guy's really into his work. Have you ever watched someone working and it was obvious they were diligent and into their work? You probably did not see this by someone working along the side of the highway somewhere. You know, most highway workers I see, they're sitting on a shovel. Or <laughs> If you're a highway worker, I've just offended you and I apologize. But have you ever noticed people who are not diligent in their work and it was just like, wow, they're so lazy, right? But have you ever seen someone that's getting things done? They're going to it. They're going to the boss and saying, what would you like me to do next? I'm ready to do it. Doesn't that, doesn't that just make you want to work with them? If you had a choice between working with the guy leaning on his shovel or the guy that's getting work done, which would you want to be around? I want to be around the guy that's getting things done. And, and then I can <laughs> No, no, no. You know, this attitude of lack of fervency, um, we, need to, we need to address it because it's a lack of faithfulness. And we can talk a lot about unfaithfulness in uh, Jesus' parables about servants who were faithful with that which is least, and those that weren't faithful, but we're not going to go there this morning. Diligence. Uh, here's another one, number 6. Look at verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Be encouraging. Verse 12. Be quick to talk of and rejoice in the hope that you have. Rejoicing in hope. Do you know that that is not an insignificant thing? Talking about the hope that we have is something that's needful in the body of Christ. And if you're going to be faithful to your new family... You're not going to be talking about all the things that you're miserable about in our world today as much as you're going to be talking about the hope that you have because of who you serve and what you're looking forward to. And that there's more to this. If your constant conversation with the body of Christ is how frustrated you are with our culture, you're probably not rejoicing in hope. Can I just tell you that? And I often criticize talk radio. But can I tell you, if all that gets you fired up is all the problems in our culture and the angst that builds up with that, and you share that angst with everybody that you're around, can I tell you that's not rejoicing in hope? Amen. It's not. It's, you ought to be concerned about the things in politics that are going on in our country. You ought to be involved in what you can be involved in. But it ought not be at the end of the day that you're known for being filled with angst as opposed to rejoicing in hope. Those are opposites. And which is it? Are you being faithful as a child of God, rejoicing in hope? Romans 12, verse 12. The next says patient in tribulation, so we're going to say being patient in trouble. All this is doing right. It's All of it is being faithful to my new family, being faithful to church. But being faithful to church is not just coming through the doors faithfully every Sunday. Being faithful to church is doing right by those that are believers in the church. Does that make sense? 
being patient in tribulation and difficulty. Um, it helps others when you respond correctly to difficulty. Haven't you ever been encouraged by someone else going through a difficulty with patience and thought, wow, if they were able to go through that with that kind of patience and hope in God, I guess I can too. Tribulation is something we all face, but at different times. When I see a brother who's handling difficulty well and patient through it, you know what? It encourages me, another brother, that I can as well. Uh, here's another one, being instant in prayer. You ought to pray much with one another. If you're going to be faithful, it will require that you pray much with one another. Now, I'm not spending hours together necessarily, but praying for one another means, hey, can I pray for you about anything this week? That's a meaningful conversation and interaction in a church setting, by the way. Can I pray for you about something this week? Or knowing that you could talk to a brother and say, hey, would you pray for me this week about this? And then text one another throughout the week and say, I'm praying for you right now about what it is. Being instant in prayer. Continuing instant prayer. Number, or verse 13 says, distributing to the necessity of saints. That's an obvious one. Be a giver to the needs of others. In the body of Christ, you're being faithful to your new family when you help them with their needs. You know they have needs, help them. Uh, verse 13, be hospitable. Given to hospitality. We could take time with every one of these, but do you get the picture here? The scripture is filled with examples and specific practical ways for you to be faithful not just to your master, but to those that are your family now. And your family, the body of Christ, has needs. Great needs. Look around, just for a moment, at everybody in here. Just take a moment, look around at these people. Look around at them. Yeah? Have you ever thought about their needs ahead of yours when you walked into a church service? I'll say it again. Have you ever walked into a church service and thought about others' needs before your own? You know, I heard once someone say, I didn't get a lot out of church. Well, what does that mean? Did you take your stuff? If all you do is come to church to take, you're not going to get much. Now, you're going to get the truth of God's Word. If, and I believe this is crucial, if you're ready to help and serve others with what you hear, if you come not ready at all to give, it's going to be really hard for you to take. If you have an eagerness to help others, to serve others, to see others' needs, to help your family's needs, your marriage's needs, those that are lost ready, you know what? When you hear the Word of God preached, it's going to be like you're a sponge. You're going to soak up so much more. When you come, try, go ahead, bless me with your message or with your music or whatever. You know what? It's hard to get through that, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit of God is grieved. And so if the Holy Spirit of God is grieved already because of our actions, guess what? He's not going to be helping you or be able to help you hear what the truth of God's Word says because you're shutting it down. I don't want to be in a position where I'm shutting down God in my life, in the preaching, in the fellowship with others because I'm not doing right by others, because I'm not looking to be faithful to my new master. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what? When I will have the right kind of thinking, I'll do right by others, I'll be serving the right master, and those in the body of Christ will be helped, and I'll be helping them. Being faithful. Heavenly Father, Help us to put this into practice this week. This is a lot of information. I pray that you'd help us to be faithful in practical areas this week. And Lord, we'll thank you for the help you alone give us in doing that. In Jesus' name, amen.